Okay, today's case we're going to talk about Lizzie Borden. Talk about an old cold case. Uh, this happened in 1892. Now, is it a cold case? It's a pretty arbitrary uh, term, cold case. I mean, when I first got into uh, the cold case business, uh, you know, you do a lot of research just like you do with anything. And I've seen a lot of different definitions for cold cases. There was... Uh, technical ones like it has to be more than 10 years and this and that and no leads and you know I looked at all of them and I thought pretty much they were all horse shit to me uh, a cold case is a case that has no resolution or there's still lingering questions about so that broadens it a lot right because there are cases where people have been arrested and there are still questions about it whether they got the right person or not so to me, that's still a cold case. I mean, that's my opinion, and that's what I go with. So I think uh, a cold case is is something that you decide yourself, and it doesn't have an official title. So with that said, we jump back in time to 1892. Yeah, a long time ago. Lizzie Borden, 32-year-old a woman who lived at home with her father, Andrew, who was a victim, and stepmother, Abby, who also was a victim. Andrew was 70 years old on August 4th, 1892, when this happened. Abby was 64. I had mentioned Lizzie Borden was 32. And the Bordens had another uh, daughter, along with Lizzie, whose name was Emma. She was 41, but she was not... Uh, at the house at the time of this tragic murder. So, Andrew Borden, we got to look at victimology. Andrew and Lizzie, I'm sorry, Andrew and Abby. Andrew was married previous to this. That wife had died. No, not under mysterious circumstances, but she passed away. They had two daughters, uh, Emma or Emmy and Lizzie. Short time later, Andrew gets remarried. He remarries Abby. Apparently, not unlike today, when a stepmother comes into the fold, there is a little bit of tension. That has been documented in this case. There was tension certainly between Lizzie and Abby. So when we look at victimology, we look at Andrew, we look at uh, his financial wealth. They were pretty off. Now, he was known to be a very frugal person. Uh, it's said that they didn't even have indoor plumbing at their house um, when most people at that time did. Uh, I don't know about that. 1892, when I think about the 1800s, I think of... Like 1881 when Billy the Kid uh, was shot and killed by Pat Garrett. So this is only 10 years later. So yeah, maybe there was indoor plumbing. I'm sure there was. I'm sure that isn't made up. But they didn't have it. But he had a lot of money at the time. There was some tension that Andrew had given his stepdaughter, so Abby's daughter, who didn't live with them, a house. And Lizzie did not like this, and neither did Emma. Now, 
you have to remember in any case, I'll give you a perfect example. Not everything is nefarious. You know what I mean? And this is how my brain works. The other day, I'm out mowing, and my tractor hit the my back door going into the basement. And the front hit it enough where it jarred the door open and split the uh, trim, the door trim. So I picked it up, and I was disgusted with myself because this is something else I have to fix and I laid it inside when I got done mowing I came inside to fix it and my immediately my brain switched to what if something happened to me tonight or what if happened something happened to somebody else in this household and the police came they're gonna look at this and think immediately forced entry right because you don't know the backstory and I would be a suspect, or whoever, you know, would be a suspect based on something that has absolutely nothing to do with the crime. I hit it with the mower, it was a mistake, but it certainly looks like forced entry, right? That's why you cannot laser in on certain things and say, that's the cause, and then this is the effect of it, because you don't know. In this case, Andrew giving the step child a home when not giving his own biological children the same immediately you think ooh motive for murder you also think well it's documented that Lizzie does not get along with stepmom in fact refused to address her as a mother which I don't blame her she but maybe back then it was a custom, that that's motive. Not necessarily, okay? So, when we looked at victimology, that's pretty much what we know. Um, Andrew, again, he was 70 years old at the time. Abby was 64. By the research that I did, Abby was well-liked. Andrew may have had some enemies, not unlike today when somebody is a successful businessman, they sometimes make enemies. So when you're starting out looking at this case, you have to start it out very broad. Okay? All the possibilities. And by the end of this video, we're going to get down to probably a single entity that's responsible for this murder. No coffee today. Today is water. Ah, flavored water at that, that. Not bad. So, on August, let's go August 3rd, 1892, a day before these murders. Remember, in any homicide or missing person, you obviously... You can go back as long as you want. Go back 10 years. You have to sometimes for victimology and find out a pattern. But it's important to concentrate on, I would say, 48 hours, 72 hours previous to the murder. What did any of the suspects do? And there may be nothing because it could be an unplanned homicide. Uh, it could be a rage homicide. There's a lot of different things. But you want to look maybe three days previous and see what the victim was doing, see what the suspect was doing. I'm not telling you anything mind-blowing here. That's uh, pretty common knowledge. So the day before, the household had a visitor. And the visitor was John Morse. Now John is, um, I believe, the brother of the deceased wife so it was Lizzie and Emma's uncle on the biological mom's side do you follow that he came to visit immediate red flag for me just because just because it's out of the ordinary and the next day something happened okay now if he had come every weekend 
probably wouldn't raise too much of a red flag for me. But he didn't. So immediately, okay, I jot that down. He's something I got to look into, so on and so forth. But what struck out to me, struck out or stuck out? Could be either. We'll go with stuck out. In the trial transcript, which I read, which was truly fascinating. And what I'll do is I'll put a, a link to that transcript in my uh, description box, I guess. Or I could be cool and like all the other people and say, down below. I never got that. That's kind of stupid to me. But I get irritated easy. And I think a lot of things are stupid. I'll put it in the description box so you can read the transcripts because it is truly fascinating. But the day before, Lizzie Borden had done a couple of things that raised red flags to me. One is she tried to buy poison. Now, you say, I never heard about this. Why not? Well, much like today, there's a lot of things that don't get reported because especially at when it's time for a trial, the judge will preclude things. I've had trials where the past criminal history cannot come into play. If they would have known that this guy had you know, seven previous arrests for robbery, maybe they would have convicted him. But instead, they didn't know about it. That's not in my case because I never lost a trial. I take that back. I did lose one trial in my career. And it was a theft case. So I take that back. Um, but some things are just precluded because they're prejudicial, apparently, to the defense. Lizzie tried to buy this poison, and when it was, when she was questioned by the police about it, she stated that she was doing something to a, I believe, a dress or something that they would use that type of product for. But it seemed very strange that it happened the day before these murders. In addition, that week, the entire family, including Lizzie, got violently ill and was throwing up. Um, they said that that was from some bad food. And when I say they, I'm going to, because I always hate when people say they. Who's they? The police, uh, the prosecution, the defense as well. But you would immediately jump to the fact, well, she was looking to buy poison. Maybe she had run out because she was poisoning her family. Good possibility, right? But she herself got sick. Now, could she have orchestrated it that she would take a lesser dose to get sick so it didn't shine suspicion on her? I would think that that's a possibility. And I'll get into why I think that's a possibility a little bit later into this um, because it ties into the crime scene and whether it was planned or unplanned. So we fast forward one day to August 4th, 1892, the day that this happened. One of the things that you must consider and look at at the time, like you do any crime that happens today, is the area, the location. Are there going to be lots of witnesses? In this case, as you see here, this is the Lizzie Borden house. It's still in existence. In fact, you can go there and spend the night. Now, I have a connection almost to the Lizzie Borden house. What is my connection? So probably a year ago, maybe it's even been two years now, I went to... Uh, this happened in Fall Rivers, Massachusetts. So I went to Massachusetts. I went to, I believe, I believe it was Bedford. I could be wrong. I don't know. It was somewhere within 30 minutes, I believe. Maybe it was New Bedford. Of Fall Rivers. I was filming a TV show. Which was entitled, When Friends Speak. So on the Reels channel. I suggest you go check that out. 
my particular cases that I was looking at at the time was Gr the Grim Sleeper, Ronnie Franklin, and Carol Baskins from Tiger King. So anyhow, they they took me, flew me up there, whatever. I did the the scenes, did my thing, and I was getting ready to come home. And one of the producers we I was having lunch with, we started talking about. Uh, true crime things and he mentioned that he had filmed a show at the Lizzie Borden house uh, a couple months previous and he says it's close to here and I'm like wow really I'd, I I want to go there so he had the number of the owner and he called the owner at lunch or no he gave me the number and I called the owner and I said uh, I told him who I was and I'd really be interested if I could come you know tour the house and he said well uh the tours are over at this such and such time which was in like 10 minutes but he said he could open up early for me if i wished and he could uh take me through very generous man and i was all for it i was like yeah you know uh, absolutely well i ended up getting a flight that left way earlier than what I intended and I never got to go. So, I was close to visiting the house. I should have, I was half an hour away and I don't know if I'll ever get that close again and I didn't go. It would have been a lot better for this assessment. Hey, that's how things work out sometimes. So I didn't get to go, but, uh, I view pictures in the location of this house. It's not a very big house, even for that time. A lot of rooms, I guess. But when you read the trial transcripts, there was a lot of activity in that house on that day. Now, you have to look at a time frame of when they died. Now, we'll jump into the time, the timeline here. So we looked at victimology. You look at the area, not a lot of crime. The house is in town, okay? It's not a... Uh, secluded house by any means so this crime happened I want to say between 9 a.m. and 10 30 a.m. it's not a big window think about all the cases where we have weeks that it happened and then days and then hours here I mean you have an hour and a half basically we're two victims being slaughtered and by slaughtered, I'll get into the, the manner of death. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a homicide, but they were killed with a sharp, blunt force object. Now, boy, is that an oxymoron. Sharp, blunt force. I say sharp because at the time, they believed that it was a hatchet. Something caved in their heads. I'm hesitant by looking at the the skulls and the medical coroner report to say that it was a hatchet initially. But the measurement of, I believe it was three and a half something that was three and a half inches caused these wounds. Now, I'm not a medical examiner, I, and I stay in my lane. Although, I think that any good investigator has to have experience in all facets of criminal investigation, including forensics, pathology, all those uh, psychology, criminal profiling. Um, so initially, I was just going to say a sharp, sharp, blunt object. A blunt object. Something. Think of uh, the blow poke. What case was that? Uh, Michael Peterson that left those slashes. No, it wasn't Eagle Talons or <laughs> Owl Talons or whatever they claim. So in this case, they eventually find what they think is the murder weapon. But before we get there, let's get to the timeline. Okay? 
This happened in the middle of the day on a busy street. Semi-busy. I mean, it's in town. That tells you a lot right there. Right there, that tells you a lot. So, at 8.45 in the morning, John Morse, the uncle of Lizzie and Emma, Lee's, he says at trial, everything was okay. There was no tension, no problems. At 9 o'clock, so 15 minutes after John leaves, victim Andrew leaves, Lizzie's dad. So now, inside that house, we have Abby, victim number one, 64 years old. We have Lizzie, daughter, 32 years old. We have Bridget, who I haven't brought up yet. She is the maid, live-in maid. She's 25. That's it. Okay? By 9 a.m., you only have three people in that house. One of them is a victim. So it's only going to leave two. Abby's killed first. Abby is downstairs, according to Bridget's testimony, dusting with a feather duster. She decides to go up to the guest room to change a, a pillow casing. That is where she's murdered. Okay? At 11 o'clock, so this happened at between 9 and 10.30, we don't know for sure. But at 11, a little bit before 11, I want to say, um, Andrew comes home. Abby is already dead upstairs. This is crucial. She's already dead upstairs. The maid is busy washing windows because Abby had instructed her to do so. Lizzie is back and forth doing things. Uh, some chores. But she's acting normal. But Abby's already dead. She's dead by what? 17 wounds to her head. The right side of her head. She's laying face down, as you see here, in between the dresser and the bed. Now, she was facing her attacker initially. So, they say. Andrew, victim number one, the father, comes home 11 o'clock in the morning. He decides he's going to take a nap. He lays down and he never gets up because at 11.10, Bridget, who had went upstairs to her room and didn't see Abby at all, decided to lay down and at 11.10, she hears Lizzie scream out, help, father's been killed. Ten minutes after he laid down there. As you see by this picture, whoever did this, did the job, right? Now, I could easily look at this picture and say, it's a rage killing. Look at that. It's personal. I watched an interview with some criminologist, and she's like, one thing I can tell you, this is personal. Bullshit. You're just repeating something that you've read out of a book, okay? And that book is outdated. Because you can't tell if something's personal by wounds. It's You can't. It is impossible. I get so frustrated when I, when I hear investigators say that. You don't know whether it's personal. Could have been the person's very first time killing somebody. And he wanted to ensure death. So instead of striking them one time, he strikes them 17 times. Till they quit shaking, till they quit moving, till they know the job is done. Is that personal? Is that rage? No. So you can't tell. 
whether it's personal. So please quit saying that. What you can say is that the person did the job and it was no accident. They intended to kill and that's what they did. So at this time, the two victims are dead. They go and get help. Then the questioning starts to arise. Reading the trial transcript, the one thing that stuck out to me was how often they locked the doors. Especially the little screen door that had a latch on it. You know, one of those little eye hooks, you know, you have the, and then you undo it. it. Seemed like every time somebody went out the house, they locked that door. Now, why did that stick out to me? I don't know. I just, it just seemed like during the course of a day, they locked that door a lot. It wasn't just at nighttime, but we don't have to worry about nighttime. This happened during the middle of the day, the morning of August 4th, 1892. So when the police start searching, let's get into evidence. You would think, number one, that whoever did this would have blood spatter on them. There was blood spatter at the scene. Just think of Jeffrey McDonald's case, where he is hitting Colette, um, and, and well, maybe that's not the best case uh, to use in as, as an example. Think of any case where there's blunt force trauma. When somebody's swinging a bat or a club and it's, it's hitting the object, let's say the head, causing the skin to split open and ooze blood and matter. Every time that bat comes down, impacting that spot that continues to bleed because it hasn't coagulated yet, it creates spatter and on the bat, cast off. Cast off is very important in the Darley Routier case, which I also looked at and they found cast off blood on her, the back of her shirt with the tails facing a different direction. By tails, you can tell by the blood drops when they drip, if a person is walking in which direction they're going and moving and so on and so forth. This person should have blood on them. Am I correct in assuming that? Well, guess what? Apparently Lizzie didn't. 10 minutes, you know, after Andrew lays down, she is calling for help. So he got murdered rather quickly. And you got to imagine this is 1892. This is not today. This is not 10 years ago. It's not 50 years ago where you're wearing a t-shirt and shorts. They wore dresses. Men wear suits. Had to be terribly uncomfortable. Whoever invented jeans and t-shirts and shorts, they're brilliant. Because if it was today, it would take less than 15 seconds to change your clothing. Right? Then, a little bit longer. Regardless, she could have still changed, but she had no blood on her. Not, Bridget didn't either. Now, we can, we can narrow this down right off the bat. I think, to three suspects. You can narrow it down to Bridget, who was in the house when both were murdered. You can narrow it down to Lizzie Borden, who was in the house when they were murdered. And lastly, let's say an outsider. Now that's a broad range of suspects, right? But that's all we have right now. You have two people in the house, with two victims, and then you have the potential that it was somebody from the outside that came in. Now, when you look at the outsiders that could have came in, there's a couple things that you have to take into consideration. Location of the house, time of day. 
I'm going to leave it at that for now. And we're going to look at the evidence. The police started looking. They found Lizzie Borden's story kind of suspect because she was telling different things of where she was and what she was doing. Her attitude was not the best. And example, I don't know if I wrote it down here in my notes or not, but she had said something when the police were questioning her right away, uh, what happened to your mom? And she immediately corrected them and said, that is not my mother. Can you look at that and, and base guilt off of it? No, no. But it's something that raised a red flag to the police officers who testified to it at trial. The evidence when they started looking is there wasn't a lot. But eventually things kind of sorted themselves out. And what do I mean by that? Well, as they're searching, they find an axe head. As you see here. But what's unique about this axe head is the handle is broke and they noted that it is freshly broke meaning it didn't happen years ago or months ago how can you tell that well I think I, th I think anybody that uses tools would know that and they certainly used a lot of tools back in 1892 especially axes and hatchets because what their source of heat, and also for cooking and such, is a fire. So they were always cutting wood. So they determined that the axe was freshly broke, the handle. Now that, that bothered me not as much as the next finding. And that is... The hatchet head itself was covered in ash, not dust, fresh ash. Now what does that mean, Kenny? Well, let's say you clean out your stove and you put the ashes in a bucket. If you just washed a hatchet and it is wet, or if there's blood on it, and it's wet, and you stick it in this bucket, it's going to adhere that ash. That is exactly how this axe head appeared to investigators. Now, there was no blood on it, and they found a couple other hatchets but none of them matched exactly to the wounds except this one. It matched exactly, I believe it was three and a half inches. So you couple all that together and they didn't find this hatchet hidden. It was downstairs with the tools in like a toolbox area. But is that the murder weapon? I'll give you my thoughts on that at the end. Now the next day, Lizzie has a friend that comes over and stays with her. She testifies at trial that she comes out and she notices Lizzie's burning a dress in the stove. Remember, that's how you cook. So... The friend says to her, what are you doing? She says, I'm burning this old dress. I got paint on it. She says, you probably shouldn't do that, especially where people can see you. So Lizzie moved out of the way of the window a little bit and kept burning. Now, is that suspect? I think that that is awfully incriminating or stupid, or both.
They have an inquest, much like a grand jury. And they, the police bring in some other evidence that they found. One is a bull or a pail down in the basement with bloody water in it and clothing of some sort or rags and I am taken aback that I don't hear much more about this because Lizzie explained it as she was menstruating and it's almost like the investigators went oh and ran the other way they don't want to hear that scared them off that's what it seems to me Certainly, we didn't have DNA back then. Yet, I'd like to know what those clothing articles were. And I don't. That is the evidence. That's it. My question is how does two people get murdered? Between 9 a.m. and 11.10 a.m., two hours and ten minutes, during the day, on a busy street, in broad daylight, with two people also in that house, didn't hear, didn't see nothing. In addition, they were always locking that door. Remember I brought that up police and they think much like I do and they're like yeah this is crazy somebody in that house had to have seen or heard something or they were involved Bridget seemed to give the most logical answers remember if you tell the truth it's always the truth it never changes. If you lie, it's hard to keep that lie because it changes. Now, sometimes when you're a good liar, like Jeffrey McDonald, it stays the same. Although he has slipped up a couple times on th some things, but uh, they didn't believe Lizzie and they arrested Lizzie. And Lizzie went on trial for the murder of her father and stepmother. At the trial, she did not testify, but she did proclaim her innocence. At one point in time during the trial, she did faint. When was that? When they introduced her father and stepmother's skull as evidence. Yeah, maybe I would have fainted too. But I think they did that not only for shock value, but to show the brutality of this crime. Now, a lot of people back in 1892 believed that a female is not capable of such type of murder. We know today, a hundred and some odd years later, that is simply not the case. Um, I think if they would have went back in time and looked at, you know, primitive people, caveman activity, women can kill. That's never changed. Now, is it a little bit odd that a daughter would kill her father with a hatchet? Sure, I might give him that, especially back in 1892. Today, eh, maybe a little bit, but not so much. The jury of all males found Lizzie not guilty, and she was acquitted. You now, Lizzie went on to live her life kind of ostracized. She never moved from Fall River. In fact, she got her inheritance from the deaths. She bought the house that she always wanted. I believe she named it Maplecroft. And she lived there with her sister for many years until... At some point in time, I want to say it was 1904, her sister Emma moved out from the house. 
and they never spoke again for 25 years until their their deaths they died the same week uh, they never spoke again now you could maybe wonder what caused that you could speculate all you want um, but if you speculated that Emma or Lizzie confessed that she actually did this, that would cause the rift. There's many things. Yet, that is the fact. Now, what do I think happened? Well, when I looked at this case, again, you get it down to two people. Third, if you want to call an outsider. And we will for this assessment. You have to. Is it possible that an outsider who was mad, let's say, at Andrew for some business dealings, came into that house and killed him with two other people in the house, three if you count the other victim, struck him with a blunt force object, let's just say it is a hatchet, and leaves. No. I mean, let me take that back. Yes. Possible. Not probable. Okay? First of all, it's the middle of the day. Second of all, it's a pretty busy area. Busy streets, houses close by. Nobody's seen any stranger. So, I think we can rule that. That includes Emma, the daughter who was out of town. That includes John Morse, the uncle who was there earlier. That eliminates them. To me, it certainly narrows it down to two people, Bridget and Lizzie. Now, when you look at those two, you have to figure out who had a potential motive. We don't know what the motive is. But motive is tricky. Let me give you an example. When you look at those two suspects, Bridget, the housekeeper, and Lizzie, you'll say, well, let's say Lizzie's motive is the inheritance. Lizzie's motive is maybe rage because she didn't like the stepmother. She was mad at father. That's motive, okay? Let's look at Bridget. You say she no, has no motive. Well, what if the motive could have been Abby telling her to wash those windows on a particularly hot morning? Is that motive? Yeah. It's motive. It's, it's not premeditated. Okay? Homicides do not have to be premeditated. That is something I want to look at here. Because when, I, when we deduce it down to those two suspects, I think you could get rid of one of them. And that is Bridget. Now, when I read Bridget's testimony at trial, she seemed to me to be very forthright. doesn't mean that that makes her innocent. But she had lived there for at least two years, I want to say. She had no problems with anybody. There's no documentation that she had problems with anybody. On the other hand, when you look at Lizzie, you're going to see that she didn't often eat dinner with the family, which was a norm. Either did Emma. They sometimes did, but most of the time, according to Bridget and others, she didn't. You look at the fact she burned a dress the very next day. She tried to buy poison the day previous. She had tension in that house with the two victims. 
Apparently, there was something with the pigeons in the barn. The father had them killed or something, and she liked those pigeons. Um, she didn't get along, as I said, with the stepmom. She had taken a vacation just weeks previous to this, and when they came back, her and Emma, they stayed in a rooming house. They didn't go home. And that was a week before the murder. So, I mean, you couple all that with the two that are left inside that house, it leaves one suspect, and that's Lizzie Borden. Now, what I try to figure out, I mean... I think you can fairly easily deduce that it was Lizzie. Sure, you're going to find some people that say, well, because of this, this, and this, it's not her. Yeah, you can do that with any case. But it's the possibilities, the probabilities. And then here, the evidence points away from the two that, there's only two that it can be. Once you're out, you exclude an outsider, which I have done because as many times as they locked that door, Every time they went out, when Lizzie went out to the barn, she locked the door. When Andrew went out to the bank, he locked the door. Everybody locked the door, even just coming in and out of the house. Not even leaving the house, just going outside of the door. So because of that, because of the location, the time of day, because of two people inside that house who said they didn't see or hear anything, you can rule out an outsider. Nobody... Is just going to wander in, kill Abby upstairs, remain in the house for two hours with nobody seeing them, and then wait till Andrew comes home, come downstairs, hoping that he's going to be sleeping, kill him, and leave with nobody seeing anything. I think that's impossible. Only two people, Bridget and Lizzie. Because of Lizzie's actions, her conflict, the things that she did previous and post behavior, I think is indicative of her guilt. Now, I want to go over some of these notes. One of the things that I had written down here, and I'm, I'm still questioning because I'm not sure, but I have it down that it was unplanned. Now, why do I say it was unplanned? Because of the time of day. And because of having another potential witness in the house. That's very brazen or very dumb. Yet, the night before this murder, Lizzie was setting up the murder. Now, by setting it up, what do I mean? Well, she was telling a friend of hers that she felt something very bad was going to happen to her father. He had a lot of enemies. This is the night before the murder. She's saying this stuff. That's setting up. That's premeditation. So then why am I saying it was unplanned? Just because of the time of day. It seemed to me, originally, looking at this scene... Looking at the case, it seemed to me that Abby was killed in a unplanned way. Now, I stopped short of saying a rage killing. Because you can't tell that, I don't believe, by just a scene. But I'm hesitant to say that when I look at her buying poison the day before and setting up the murders by talking to a friend the day before. That's premeditation. But w why wouldn't she instead wait till nighttime when they're in bed sleeping? Couldn't she easily kill them both? Maybe she felt that was too hard. That once she started killing one person, the other one would wake up. Or something. Whatever it was in her mind that she thought that she couldn't do that. 
So therefore, after I wrote down unplanned, wait till night in the bed, Abby's potential rage, maybe Abby said something to her that made her snap, and then why kill the father? After I take all that in consideration, I realize it makes more sense that it was premeditated. And there was a statement that she had made to Bridget that morning about a store having a sale on some cloth and she should go. I think that little slip up there was Lizzie trying to get Bridget out of the house because she was going to follow through with this plan. But Lizzie's demeanor after these murders, and I'm talking minutes after these murders, after she had already, I believe, killed Abby upstairs, she continues on ironing. Like nothing happened downstairs. That is a true sociopath. All it would take is Bridget to go upstairs into that room and she would find Abby dead. Instead, she continues and has a normal conversation, except for what I previously had mentioned, to try to get Bridget out of the house. Now, why couldn't she just order Bridget out of the house? I believe she probably could, but for whatever reason, she didn't. And Bridget ended up going upstairs to lay down. Now, I would want to know how common was that? I would be asking Lizzie that. Obviously, I'd ask Emma that. Did she normally go upstairs to lay down? Because she's laying down at the exact time that Andrew gets murdered. And to me, that's either a suspect, that's a red flag, or that's when Lizzie strikes. And obviously, it's one or the other or both. There's no way Lizzie knew, I don't think, that Andrew was going to come home and take a nap, right? Now, what really sealed me on Lizzie's guilt is the fact that she told Bridget, and she told her father this because it was overheard by Bridget, that Abby had gone out. She had gotten a note to check on somebody that was sick. That note was never produced. Bridget never saw anybody come to the door. And in fact, Abby was upstairs in the bedroom dead. So it's very obvious to me that Lizzie Borden made up that story so nobody would wonder where Abby was. So we can certainly say that Abby Borden is guilty of this crime. What I can't say is why. But when I initially looked at it, I believed that it was unplanned. But the more I looked at the trial transcripts and the witness statements, I think there was premeditation there. And it was a crime of opportunity. So can you have a premeditated homicide when it's a crime of law. Sure. Sure you can. She was going to do it. She was waiting for the right time to strike. She got Abby alone upstairs. No defensive wounds on Abby. If it was a stranger that came in, and remember, she was struck in facing her attacker, except for one blow to the back of the neck. If she is facing somebody that she doesn't know that is wielding an instrument, don't you think that there would be some defensive marks trying to block it? Now, is it possible she was hitting the back of the neck first? And then on the side? I don't think, according to the medical testimony, 
they're pretty adamant that she was facing her attacker. So she gets Abby isolated and alone upstairs, kills her. In true psychotic fashion, she starts ironing her clothing and carrying on a normal conversation about a sale that a place is having. All the while, her stepmom's upstairs dead. Now she's back and forth. She goes out to the barn. She could be wiping off the weapon. Who knows? She waits until dad comes home, tells dad, stepmom's not here. She got a note to go somewhere. Stepdad lays down on the couch and is bludgeoned to death by the same instrument. Now the handle at some point breaks. Is that intentional? Or was she swinging it with enough force for it to break? I would say that's hard for me to believe, but I have no idea what shape that handle was in. Maybe it was already cracked. Nobody knows. I do believe that that was the murder weapon. There's no reason for it to be covered in ash unless it was cleaned. Um, she certainly was doing something out in that barn. And nobody knows. Now, one of the things that I, that I said bothered me was the burning of the dress. The timing of it stinks, right? But what if she's telling the truth? Well, there's an easy way to determine that. If I was an investigator, I would look around the house. If Lizzie wouldn't tell me, and I would ask Bridget, Emma, hey, what's been freshly painted? I mean, you should be able to tell that just by visual observation. If you see something, okay, she has some validity to her story. But if not, there's something to it, right? Now, I go back to experience. I had a case where a murderer, when I was questioning him, I had a witness, saw blood on his pants hours after this murder. And I asked him about it. I said, what about the witnesses that saw blood on you? You know what he said? That's right. He gave the same Lizzie Borden excuse. Oh, that was red paint. Lizzie Borden could have said anything. She could have said, I burnt the dress because it didn't fit anymore. I burnt the dress because I spilled sour milk on it. It ripped. But she says paint. To me, paint is indicative of another substance. Red in color comes from the body. Blood. That's my interpretation. I want to go through my notes here. Because I wrote a lot down. Try getting Bridget out of the house. The tension in the home. The timeline. Told dad, and I got a big star by this. Told dad, Miss Borden had gone out. Note from someone that somebody was sick. Which was a lie. I have no blood spatter here. That's because I didn't... I, I originally saw that there was no testimony about blood spatter. And that, to me, would tell me why Lizzie Borden didn't have blood on the dress when people observed her 10 minutes after the crime. She certainly could have changed that dress that quick and then hid it and then burned it the next day. Apparently, that's what she did do. But originally, I wrote, well, there's no blood spatter at the scene, so then she wouldn't have any on her, but that did not make sense to me. And then when I went back and read the trial transcripts, there was blood spatter. Um, and remember, if this is premeditated, uh, it's possible that, you know, maybe she had two dresses on and took one off immediately afterwards and hid it, or she just simply changed. 
Lizzie directed uh, Bridget to Abby's body. That's important. Uh, after this happened, Abby's body was not discovered first. It was Andrew's body. And then Lizzie said, go check the guest room for Abby. I swear she came home. Remember, she had said that she had gone out. But then she says, right after the murder of her father, go check upstairs. I believe I heard her come home. That's telling. She tried to purchase the poison the day before. The, there's not two suspects in this case. One suspect, and the reason I know that, I'm sorry, I was swanting. I don't know what it was. Um, the wounds are the same. By that, unless two people came in with two hatchets and did the crime. Usually, and this is not foolproof, if there are two suspects, two offenders, you have two different manners of death. Not always. It could be two gunshots. But a lot of times, it'll look different. The scenes will look different. Here, they're almost identical. The murder weapon, I believe that it was that hatchet, had fresh ash, 3.5 inches, matches the wound. The burn dress covered in paint, I have down here wet paint. Well, what was painted? It should be easily determined. One of her contradictory statements was that when her father came home to take a nap, she took his shoes off and put his slippers on them, which is a blatant lie. Look at the photograph. He has his shoes on. Now, why would she lie about that? if she wasn't involved. You know what I mean? That doesn't make sense. The pail with the blood in it, we talked about that. The menstrual cycle, and they were like, oh, we, okay. Didn't even want to investigate it, it seems like. I have Emma moved out of their home in 1904, and they didn't speak again until they died in 1927. Lizzie was 66 years old when she died. She never married, she lived alone. There was always a rumor, I guess, or not maybe always, but at some point in time someone put forth that uh, Bridget and Lizzie were having a lesbian encounter when Abby caught them. Hence, they both killed her because it was taboo at the time. And then they confessed to Andrew, and then they killed him. I don't buy that, because if they confess to Andrew, what's he, what's he going to do? Okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm just going to lay down and take a nap. No. That makes no sense. Now, is it possible that she was uh, a lesbian? Sure. So what? I mean, she never got married. She lived alone. But there's a lot of people that live alone, aren't married, never got married, never had a boyfriend. It uh, doesn't mean that uh, they're homosexual. And even if it does, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that that is the reason for this murder. She was arrested for shoplifting four years after she was acquitted for this murder. I don't like that. You know what that tells me? That tells me that's somebody that believes they're smarter than somebody else. She has money. Four years after that acquittal. Why does she have to shoplift? Is it because she thinks she can get away with it now? Rules do not apply to her? Is she that arrogant? And I have night before she was setting up the scene, which makes it premeditated murder. Very fascinating case, Lizzie Borden. Uh, I enjoyed looking at this case. I love older cases like this. I should have went to the house when I was up there. I think at one point in time, I had convers. I know I had conversation with Kathleen Ramslin. Uh, she's an she's an author. Got a couple books here from her 
Um, but we talked at a conference one time about she had just spent the night there. And I thought that would be a really cool thing to do was to go up there and spend the night. And I still have that on my bucket list. I would like to do that. Certainly would like to go up there and tour the house if I ever get up to around Fall Rivers again. I would certainly like to do that. Um, but it's fairly easy to me to determine that Lizzie Borden did this. Now, did the jury get it right? Uh, I don't know. I think there was enough evidence there to convict her. I think if she was tried today, she would be convicted. Uh, because at the time, I think they just thought women could not do such a horrific act. But when you start deducing possibilities, the probabilities, hey, there's no one else that could have done this crime. Sure, you could possibly say it was Bridget, but there's no motive there. There's no reason for it. Um, there's no evidence against her when it all points to the only other person it could have been. And don't give me this crap that it was an intruder. Okay, Nobody's coming into that house at 9 o'clock in the morning, killing one, leaving, coming back, killing the other one, or staying in that house with two other people running around all day. It just makes no sense, especially with them locking the doors. It makes no sense. There's only one person that makes sense. When you look at the totality of everything, remember, it's everything. Direct evidence, indirect evidence. It's Lizzie Borden. She's guilty. And she got away with it. So, hey, more power to her. But what a fascinating case. All right, that's it for today. Lizzie Borden, good case. Until next time. Hey, I forgot to keep mentioning. Go become a, a member. So every Monday, I answer questions and post videos for the premier and exclusive membership. If you want more content, subscribe. No, you already did that, right? Become a member and buy some merch. You know, everyone's always asking me, hey, what, where'd, you, where'd you get that Unsolved No More shirt? There's a link. I mean, I, people set this stuff up. It's on there. You just got to find it. Search it. Research these cases. Go back. Read this trial transcript. It's crazy. So until next time, Maine's out. We're